Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Elam today. Can I just bid you a special welcome if you're here for the first time. Thank you for choosing to come and worship with us this morning. And we will have some refreshments at the end um, by the kitchen. So please do hang about if you've got the time and just spend a wee bit more time with us later on. Uh, there is also going to be a Sunday school upstairs. Um, so I'm told. Yes. Yeah. Just looking for confirmation of that. Um, just a little update on on your Isabel, Bob. She the, the surgery went fine. She is in a lot less pain than expected, and you feel that she's well about herself because she's already bossing you about and got you doing all the stuff that it's like nothing's happened. So, um, any, anything anything you want to just add or throw in? Yes. Yep, there is going to be a meal plan. Um, Sue is. It's, it's all going. It's all going. It's all going. Yeah, so, so you need to take care of dinner tonight. Get yourself fed. I, I said to Bob and Isabel about the meals and stuff, and Bob was like, you know, I'm just, I'm just happy with an egg. <laughs> just a solitary egg. Bob's happy. So. He's a Spartan, but yeah, Isabel might want something a wee bit more. But yeah, well, we let us just thank God then, shall we? Lord, we do thank you for for this good news. Lord, it was a it was a prayer for a lot of us that Isabel would be would be safe and well, and it appears that she has been. So God, we give you glory for that. We just we thank you, God, that she's not in a whole lot of pain. She was expecting to be in a whole lot of pain, but she isn't. So we give you glory for that, God, and we say thank you. And we just ask, God, that you just accelerate her healing, keep her at peace, keep her in, in good health, and, and bring her out of this stronger and more faithful and more ready to jump up and down and praise you than she was before. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And um, before we move into a time of worship, just one other thing. We did get a message from Liz today just saying she is not here now. She's had to go into hospital. Um, we don't have all the kind of details on that, but perhaps we just stand. Is that okay? Have you? Okay, yeah. Abdominal pain, suspected gallbladder. She did have a little bit of, a little bit of work on her gallbladder, which kind of was unsuccessful last year um, which caused her quite a bit of grief and then I think her medication maybe took care of some of it so it could be that flaring up again but let's just commit Liz to the Lord Father we, ju we just lift Liz up to you right now God and Lord Liz she just seems to be going through so much all the time she was in at the beginning of the year last year I think with a with the gallbladder stuff and then she had to have that really invasive heart operation god and we give you thanks for the way that she has recovered from that and came through it but here she is again lord in the hospital and she's got so much pressure in her life and so many external things always niggling away at her and trying to to drag her down god we just give you praise for her faithfulness towards you we give you praise for her for her dedication and her obedience lord for always always moving towards you and always trying to dig deep into you so lord we just we come alongside her this morning we we circle ourselves around her as her church family and we just pray on her behalf god lord we just say fill her with your holy spirit lord fill her with your strength and your power god resource her we pray, Lord, that the roots of her spirit would just grow deeper and deeper right now into the well of your love and your power and your care. Lord, may she know your presence in her spirit, in her soul, and in her physical body, Lord. Lord, would your healing power flow through her in the name of Jesus. Touch her stomach, God. Touch her gallbladder, Lord, and just bring her perfect healing we pray, God, that she is released from hospital today. We pray that she's released quickly and that there is no concerns that this pain is gone. Any adverse symptoms are gone. 
Lord, and she is released with a clean bill of health. In Jesus' name, we lift her up to you this morning. Amen. 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 Just as we begin to move into a time of worship, I was I was praying this morning upstairs with Manny, our little kind of morning prayer meeting. You're all invited to it, by the way. And the Lord just a picture, a picture from the the Easter story of when when Jesus was buried. It wasn't enough that Jesus was was dead and buried. The, and they sealed the tomb, they put a big stone over the tomb. But then the enemies of Jesus went to Pilate and demanded more security. And Pilate said, go away then and make the tomb as secure as you can. Put the stone in front of it, seal it afterwards, and then set a guard in front of it. And I just felt the Lord was speaking to me about about Satan's Satan's desire to constantly put blockages in the way between you and Jesus. Satan's desire to constantly separate you from him and to to bring, as you will, these, these boulders into your life, these blockages to stop you seeing him, to stop you getting to him and just the determination of Jesus' enemies it wasn't enough that there was a, a boulder in the way. They had to seal it around the edges. They had to put a Roman guard on it. I just felt the Lord saying to me to pray for those of you here today who have blockages in your life, perhaps blockages you're aware of, perhaps you're unaware of them, perhaps you've got no idea what I might be talking about. But I felt the Lord saying that carrying offences, carrying grudges, carrying unforgiveness in your heart, these are the boulders of choice that Satan uses in our lives nowadays. Satan will try and stop what the Holy Spirit is doing in your life by setting you as a guard over your own blockage not letting you let go stirring up your anger stirring up your animosity stirring up your self entitlement to hold on to that grudge to hold on to that unforgiveness to carry that offence because why shouldn't you be angry at them don't they deserve it? If that resonates with you, I just feel that the Lord would say to you that you have been deceived into guarding and securing your own spiritual blockages. Things that are stopping you from being who God wants you to be. Things that are stopping you from coming to God. Perhaps the way that you need to come before Him. And things that are stopping God from placing into your hands what He's got for you. Because you are too busy holding on to something else. If this resonates with you this morning, I'm just going to ask you to do a simple thing. I'm going to ask all of us to do it so no one feels exposed. But I'm going to ask you if... The Holy Spirit is speaking to you, telling you that you have been holding on to something. I'm going to ask all of us right now just to put our hands out in front of us, palms facing upward, fingers open. We're all going to do this, but this is especially for those of you that the Holy Spirit is speaking to this morning, those of you who need to let go of something. You might need to let go of it more than once. You might need to learn the rhythms of letting go of this. Some roots go deep. But right now, in the presence of Jesus, turn your palms towards Him and ask Him by His grace 
to help you let it go. And with your empty hands, receive what he's got for you this morning. Father, we come before you now, your children and your servants, God, our lives committed to you. And we know, Father, that we will fail in our mission of serving you if we are preoccupied holding on to our own stuff. Lord, we want our hands to be free to take hold of what you have got. We want our souls to be free of anything toxic and anything polluting that is holding us back or keeping us down. We ask this morning, Holy Spirit, come and blow through this building. Come and blow through our lives, through our hearts and our minds and our souls, Lord. We pray for a for a clearing, cleansing breath of God to come through us right now. To blow away the old cobwebs of resentment, old cobwebs of, of past offences. Come and blow the, the dust and the stir and all the rubbish away, Father. And clean us up again for our service in Jesus. and have your way, Father. Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus you would give to us what you want to give to us this morning, Lord. For those who need healing, we pray for healing. For those who need compassion and and counselling in their very souls, God, we pray that the presence of God, the love of God would be poured into them. Lord, for those who need courage this morning to keep on going, strength to get back up, guidance Lord to know what to do Lord we know that you are available we know that you are here we know that you love us and are for us so we pray God come and be the God we need you to be this morning and may anything of us that stands in the way be blown out the way this morning God hallelujah hallelujah needs to borrow one this morning and um, as always we just put that little invitation out there if, if you're here today and you don't have a bible that you own maybe it's your first time in a church um, you're very welcome to take one of those home with you and just keep it as a little gift from us this morning if you turn in them to mark 6 verse 45 After the message, we're just going to take a little bit of time of reflection, a little bit of time of praise. We're going to invite the Holy Spirit to come close to us, and we're going to have a couple of members from our prayer team available for prayer, should anyone want that. Richard and Jenny, you guys are... Jenny, don't, I've spoke to Richard about it. He's already volunteered you. Richard and Jenny, I think, are going to be down the front somewhere. Manny is going to be at the back, if you feel a bit more comfortable going to the back rather than the front. And we're just going to take a wee bit of minute, a wee bit of time, and and wait on the Holy Spirit. And if you want prayer, these guys will be available to to listen to you, to pray for you, whatever you need. We're going to be looking this morning at the passage where Jesus walks on the water. Arguably one of Jesus' most famous miracles in that, in that even people who don't read the Bible, people who haven't read the Bible, probably know that walking on water is something that's associated with Jesus. So we're going to start reading Mark 
verse 6, we'll start at Mark chapter 6, starting at verse 45. Immediately after, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on the mountainside to pray. Later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake and he was alone on the land. And he saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. And shortly before dawn, he went out to them, walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them and says, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. And then he climbed into the boat with them and the wind died down and they were completely amazed for they had not understood about the loaves and their hearts were hardened. Now we'll stop there. The first thing I want to say about this, this passage is that the disciples were in a storm or what I should say is they were in another storm. Isn't it funny how followers of Jesus keep on finding themselves in storms? Just two chapters earlier, Mark chapter 4, these, these very same guys were on the very same lake, possibly in the very same boat, in another storm. This time they were caught in a, in a furious squall on the verge of drowning all the while Jesus was asleep in the back and... I think many of us will know how that story ends. The disciples are they're, they're brought to the edge of panic. They cry out for Jesus to get up and save them. He, he, he wakes from his sleep. He rebukes the wind and the waves. And the storm is calmed. Hallelujah. End of story. Let's hope our poor disciples never have to get through anything like that again. But then, just two chapters later... Once again, they find themselves in another storm. Once again, they're in a storm because of where Jesus was leading them. And once again, Jesus doesn't seem to be doing very much to help them. And I don't know, I'm just throw this out there before we carry on, but um, does anyone else sometimes get tired of facing the same old problems you know like like sometimes we go through things and it's hard and it's a challenge and by the grace of god we overcome or god intervenes and then that that problem is finished that crisis is dealt with and then we never go through that thing again you know it's like it's like a once in a lifetime thing it's, it's like when you beat a boss at the end of a level in a computer game. You know, you, you beat the boss and then you move on to the next level. You don't have to then come back and fight that boss all over again. It's like, it's, it's won and it's done. But then, there are sometimes these other things in life, these boomerang situations, things that feel like they just keep on coming back Goliaths that won't stay dead, dragons that just won't stay slain, wounds that just keep on reopening. And just like these poor disciples, sometimes you feel like you've, you've, you've barely got your feet dry from the last storm before Jesus sends you back out in the boat again. Does anyone here ever, ever feel like that? You just think like, how on earth? How on earth am I going through this again? After all these years, how, how is this still an issue for me? That this temptation, this anxiety, this wound, this fear, this sickness, this person. I thought I'd be over this by now. Yet here I am going around the same mountain, stuck in the same storm, over and over. The disciples found themselves in, in this 
type of situation boomeranged right back in. However, having said that, it wasn't exactly the same situation. There was a couple of differences that I just want to point out. One difference was the type of storm they were in. The first time it's described as a furious storm. Mark 4.37 says it comes out of nowhere and it almost swamps the boat. And that's probably a really good description of what actually happened. The, the Sea of Galilee is, is actually a lake. So you wouldn't imagine too many storms on it, but it, it's 680 feet below sea level. It's surrounded by hills and mountains. And even today, when the wind sweeps down over the hills, it kind of bottlenecks the air pressure on top of the water, creating these massive waves. So, so you do get these, these big violent storms that just come out of nowhere. And, and life can be like that. We get these crisis moments that just, they come out of nowhere. One minute it's just smooth sailing on the lake and the next minute you're fighting for your life. But this new storm that the disciples were in was different. It says here they were trapped in a strong headwind. Verse 38 describes it less. It says the disciples were straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Whatever direction they were going, the wind was blowing the exact opposite way, just, just, just pushing them back, and they're just rowing and rowing and rowing just to, just to keep pace, just to stop themselves from being pushed back. This wasn't a sudden crisis that just swept in out of nowhere and, and threatened to overwhelm them, and which swept back out again just as quickly. This was a long, enduring, draining slog. Mark says that they got in the boat the previous day after Jesus fed the 5,000. And yet here it is, almost sunrise the following morning, and they're still only in the middle of the lake. Can you, can you identify a little bit with their exhaustion? Can you imagine their, their discouragement? Their, their aching, burning shoulders, their freezing cold knuckles. They've come too far to go back, but they're too tired to keep moving forward. These types of situations, these aren't the mighty storms of life. These are the marathon storms of life. The ones that just never seem to end, the ones that just that just slowly grind you down, wear you out. Some of these storms are, are situational, you know, like trying to live with, with a chronic illness, or a single parent, or maybe even two parents trying to raise kids while holding down jobs and not getting a minute to kind of breathe. Being married to someone who maybe causes you more, more grief than joy. Some of these storms are Storms of the soul, like living life with a, a temptation you can't shake or a trauma you can't move past, with a wound or a weakness, with, a, with an addiction or a regret. Whatever it is, can we all just agree, everybody's got something. We've all got something, a headwind in our life that never gets tired of pushing you back. And the other thing that was different about this storm was that Jesus wasn't even in the boat. During the first storm, Jesus was sleeping. Doesn't seem like he's been a lot of use there, but at least he was there. And when they got desperate enough, they cried upon him. He woke up and he dealt with the situation. But this time Jesus isn't even in the boat. The supernatural saviour is he, he's not just silent, he's absent. He's not just sleeping, he's missing. And time and time again, throughout your own spiritual journey, you are going to find yourself in a situation where Jesus just seems quieter than usual, where he just he just seems a wee bit further away. He just just seems like he's not really with you in it. There'll be times when he doesn't 
answer your prayers straight away. There'll be times when he doesn't calm that storm. And there'll be times it feels like he's not even in the boat at all. Have you ever felt like that? Do any of you feel like that this morning? Here's the thing that I want to kind of move on to. Just because they couldn't see Jesus doesn't mean Jesus couldn't see them. Mark makes this really clear. Verse 47, Later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake and Jesus was alone on the sand and he saw them straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Jesus saw them. They couldn't see him, but he could see them. Yes, he was missing, but he was also watching. They were aware of his absence. He was aware of their obedience. And the reason Jesus could see them is because he was higher than them. Mark's already told us when the disciples were out in the boat, Jesus was up the mountain praying. He probably had his eyes on them the whole time. Before our kids were born, one of our kind of favourite spots to go to was, was Cat Bells in, in the Lake District by Keswick. And Cat Bells is a lake, is, is a mountain by a lake, made famous by Beatrix Potter because Mrs. Tiggy Winkle lives up there somewhere, up in the summit. She's got a wee house, a wee door if you go and look for it. And we've noticed time and time again, see when you're on the lake side or you're on one of the wee boats, see if you look closely on a clear day, you can see people up the mountain. You can see them with their wee backpacks and high vis moving about like little ants. See when you're on the mountain, you see everything. You see the whole lake, you see every boat on it, you see the people at the other side. It's a different situation. And Jesus was able, able to see them because he was higher than them. And guess what? He is still higher than us. In a sense, I think this, this kind of image we get it is a bit of a prophetic picture of where Jesus is now. Jesus, in Mark 6, Jesus is on the mountain. He's praying to the Father while watching over his disciples. He's standing in between with one eye on God and one eye on us. Today, Jesus is sitting on the highest mountain of all. He's sitting on the throne of heaven at his Father's right-hand side, still interceding to him on our behalf, all the while watching over us through the presence of his Holy Spirit who is with us. Amen. You might not see him, but he sees you. He sees you and he is with you. And not only does he see you, but he sees everything else too. He sees the struggle that you're going through. He sees the maturity that's been formed in you as you trust in him. He sees the strength that's growing in you as you endure. He sees you giving glory to God one day for this very pain that you're feeling right now. He sees you ministering to others through the grace that is being formed in you by this difficulty. He sees you thanking God, believe it or not, for not rescuing you today like you are asking him to, but for letting you endure and letting you overcome by forcing you to rely on him evermore. He has the big picture here. He has your big picture. He doesn't just see where you are. He sees where you're going. When you feel like you're in the fire, he sees the gold that's been purified. When you feel like you've been pressed, he sees the old flesh dying and the spiritual muscle being formed. When you feel that you can't take any more, he sees the roots of your spirit growing deeper into God, looking for that power that you've been crying out to him for. 
he sees the Christ likeness being formed in you because of this storm that you're in. Amen. And not only does he see you, but he lets you see him. The other encouragement we see here is he lets you see him. Look at what Mark says, verse 48. Shortly before the dawn, he went out to them, walking upon the lake. He was about to pass by them, but when they saw him walking, they thought he was a ghost and they were terrified and they cried out. But immediately he spoke to them and he says, Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. This is the the famous scene where Jesus shows his supremacy over nature by walking atop the water. In Jewish mythology, they believed that hell was under the sea, that it was in the centre of the earth. Hell was a place of chaos outside of God's order and nowhere on earth was more chaotic than the turbulent, dark waves. That's why when Jesus allowed the demons to go into the pigs, they all ran off the cliff and drowned in the sea. It was a picture to the onlookers of Jesus literally casting these demons back into hell. That's the message that they got from it. The Jews fought the bottom of the sea was a place for the demons. So what message did it send when Jesus laced up his sandals and walked on top of it? Not only is he overruling the, the physical elements here, but the spiritual elements as well. It's, it's an epic demonstration of his power and his authority and his supremacy over everything and anything. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But, because it is such an epic demonstration of his power, I think sometimes it can blind us a little bit to some of the other stuff that's happening in this verse. Mainly what Jesus' intention was, which was to pass them by. Jesus didn't go out walking on the water in order to get into the boat. Jesus went out walking in the water in order to walk past it. Close enough to be seen, but not close enough to intervene. Why was that? Why does Mark tell us that? What was his plan here? I think Jesus was doing something here in front of his disciples that we see God doing in the Old Testament. And that is on special occasions when his people needed him the most, God would come down to them and he would pass by them. Do you remember Moses? Do you remember after the Israelites worshipped the golden calf, Moses smashed the Ten Commandments? Afterwards, Moses had to go back up the mountain. He had to go back to God. And he has this big conversation with God. And he says to him, show me your glory. I want to see you. And God says to him, nobody can see my face and live, but I will let my goodness pass by you. And then it says in Exodus 33, 21, that God shelters Moses in the cleft of a rock, covers him and protects him with his hand, and he allowed his glory to pass by Moses. Moses gets this demonstration of God's glory and power passing in front of him. The same way that the wave-walking Jesus passed in front of his disciples in the boat. Sounds similar. Do you remember Elijah? When he was up the same mountain in his cave, suffering with burnout and depression. And he stands at the mouth of the cave and he looks out And God shows him a hurricane and then an earthquake and then a fire. And then he hears the still small voice of the Holy Spirit 
cutting through all of it. You know how this whole experience in the Bible is described? It says, God told him to go out and stand on the mountain for the Lord was going to pass by him. 1 Kings 19.11 In order to lift Elijah out of his depression, God said that he was going to pass by him. And he did so in the form of a still small voice that spoke louder than all the natural disasters he was witnessing. Passing by is something God did in the Old Testament. It's something he did to give his servants courage, to give them strength. He didn't come down to fix their problem, but he came down to show them that he was bigger than it. He didn't come down to intervene, but he came down to be seen, to give a revelation of his closeness and his supremacy over the situation in an attempt to stir up their courage and to stir up the strength of those who've seen them, to remind them that they're not alone and they're certainly not abandoned. That's what God did in the Old Testament on several occasions. And I believe that that's what Jesus was doing here on the water. Mark says, he came to them walking on the water and was about to pass by them. Just enough to stir up their faith just enough to remind them who's really in control so that they keep on digging and keep on pushing and I believe that this is what Jesus wants to do with you and me yes there are times when he will climb in the boat and calm the storm that's what he ended up doing in this passage but remember Jesus didn't calm the storm because the disciples were full of faith. He calmed the storm because they were full of fear. Verse 49, when they saw him walking on the sea, it was supposed to be a miraculous moment. It was supposed to be, a, there's Jesus. We're not alone. Look how awesome he is. We can do this. Should have been a peak moment. When they saw him, they thought he was a ghost and they cried out for they saw him and were troubled. They failed to learn the lessons that Moses and Elijah learned. They failed to put their trust in him when he was passing by. And so rather than continue to just force them forward beyond what they could bear, Jesus got into the boat and calmed the storm for them. Are you with me? Jesus doesn't Calm your storm because you've got the right amount of faith. You've got you finally got enough faith to twist his arm. He calms your storm because you don't have the necessary faith to ride it out with him. What did Jesus say when he calms the storm in Mark 4? He says, Oh ye of little faith, why are you so afraid? It's like when you fail your driving test. The instructor says, turn off the ignition, take the keys out and swap seats with me. When we can't do anymore, when we won't do anymore, Jesus does take over. But the trajectory that God has for us is spiritual maturity. You know, some people will try and say to you, that the reason bad things happen to you is because you've not got enough faith. I don't think that's right. I think sometimes it's the people with the greatest amount of faith who go through the greatest trials because God knows he can trust them with it. God knows that those children of his are strong and getting stronger and they're not just some damsel in distress. It needs to be supernaturally rescued from every bad day. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, God does not allow us to be tempted beyond what we can bear. And so if what you are facing is great, then so too must be your ability to bear it. Otherwise, God wouldn't be letting you bear it. Amen. Jesus lets us bear the weight. 
He lets us fight our giants. He lets us stand in the fiery furnace for a time. But when he does, you're never alone. And there will be moments throughout where his goodness, where his closeness, where his presence passes you by. There'll be moments in your worship. There'll be moments in your prayer. There'll be moments in your tears where the Spirit of God comes close to you. Not to intervene, but to be seen. Not to change your situation, but to change your perspective. Not to calm your storm, but to calm you despite it. To switch your focus from the waves to the one who walks on top of them. Invite our music group just to come up, please. Can we just get a wee bit of music before we move into a time of reflection? Have you been struggling? Trapped, stuck in your own headwind this morning? Remember that Jesus sees you in it. Remember that you're not alone that you're not abandoned and that you're not forgotten. You are in his sights. And no, he may not be jumping in straight away to take the struggle away. He wants you to know that he is with you in it. And he wants you to know that he is in it to bring you to a place where your faith in him takes you through it. So hold on. Hold on to those those moments of encouragement. Hold on to those moments of closeness when he passes you by. They're like little road signs reminding you that you're on the right track. Remember, your sat-nav's never more quiet than when you're going in the right direction. If that's you this morning, let's just invite Jesus to come and be close to us right now. Shall we stand? Let's invite him. Invite his presence. Invite his encouragement. Invite his Holy Spirit to come and have his way. If we could just do without the singers for a wee minute. Let's just have a wee bit of music. few members from our prayer team are, are available should you want prayer but I just I just want to try something with you if you would just perhaps close your eyes where you are right now I want you to imagine yourself in that boat you're tired and you've been struggling all night you don't feel like you're getting anywhere and you feel like giving up you feel alone you feel forgotten and then as you're in that place you look up and you see Jesus in the middle distance walking past you on top of the very water has given you so much trouble the thing that you fear the most is under his feet and the higher those waves lift the higher he lifts up with them and as you see him Jesus is turning and he's looking at you your locking eyes what does he want you to know in that moment what is the voice of the Holy Spirit saying to you in that situation you're still carrying the weight still got to keep that boat steady but Jesus is there and you see his overcoming power 
resonating all around them. What does he want you to know right now in this moment as your eyes meet? Just let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Let him speak to your heart because that is what he is wanting to say to you. For many of you, that is the situation. have a moment right here where the God of heaven passes by us a revelation of his goodness a revelation of his faithfulness a reminder of his closeness and his love for us doesn't mean your problem is going to be solved by the time you go home today but that's not what's important. He is what's important. What is he saying to you right now? I'm just going to stay in this moment and let the Holy Spirit minister move into a time of worship and the prayer team will be available. cannot bear. Thank you, Lord, for taking that shame, that sin, Lord, the burdens that we could not bear. Thank you, Lord, for taking our place, taking what we should have taken, but we couldn't bear. Thank you, Lord, for saving us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. King Jesus. Amen. Morning, everybody. By now, you will know that I have thrust into your hand, whether you like it or not, <laughs> one of these, one of these 24/7 prayer le prayer leaflets. That oh gosh, that's better. Okay, okay, all right. Start again. Right now, you all know that I've been a nuisance. I've thrust one of these into your hands because I'm passionate that we join in. Please join in. It tells you everything here. A 24-hour-7 prayer room is being set up in a Life Destiny Church in the week leading up to Pentecost. Pentecost is where our church started, where evangelism started, where prayer communally started. It's important. And we're being asked to join in by booking a time, just one hour, to be with the Lord, somewhere between 7 p.m. on Sunday the 12th of May, all the way through to 7 p.m. Sunday the 19th of May. Which means that if you want to book in at 3 a.m., please do. But try and find one hour out of your busy life just to sit with the Lord. And you might think, Oh, I can't pray for an hour. Yes, you can. 
you have a Bible, bring it. And after you've prayed for your friends and your family and world peace and Gaza and Ukraine and the persecuted church in uh, India and China and every single Muslim country, and ever, when you've prayed over the drought in Africa and the poor farmers and the fact that one day there are going to be even more refugee camps than there are already, and you've already prayed over the ones in Calais and you've prayed over the Rohingya in Bangladesh, I think your hour, I think your hour might be filled. So please, please try and find just one hour and book yourself in, easy, the link's there. Book yourself in for just one hour. Think of it as getting away from the kids, if nothing else. Thank you, Manny. Yeah, so um, that's going to be over there, isn't it? So check out the website and maybe somebody will be brave and go for one of those AM slots, one of those middle of the night ones. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you. That was a new song, wasn't it? I've not heard that one before. That was good. Well done. Did you do it last week? Just at the beginning. I was... Was it? Ah, right, okay. I was, you know, I was so with the Lord at that moment that I don't, I don't notice these, these material things sometimes. But thank you, I look forward to it being perfected. <laughs> um, no, thank you very much, that was wonderful. Um, good, let's have some refreshments. God bless.